Hello, hello, dear ones. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Maria. Today we're going, doing a Q&A video that I've been wanting to do for months, I feel like. Thank you all for submitting your great questions. I know as you are listening to my podcast, watching my videos, things do come up. We're talking about all kinds of complicated issues. And so um, I figured a Q&A video is overdue. I also wanted Sergey to join us today because there are a lot of questions and yeah, he is going to be helping out today and reading them for me so I could respond to you in real time. And that's that. Cool. All right. Well, why don't we dive right in? Yes, we do have a lot of questions and I have a big list here. Uh, thank you uh, so much for submitting your questions. And uh, the first one is uh, very tricky. It's about time. So how does source perceive time? Does source have the constraints of time? Um, time is a construct that lives within the matrix. So it lives within the virtual reality that we all are experiencing day in and day out. So, to, uh, you know, as it comes to source consciousness, there is no time. What Source is concerned with is the presence or the absence of things and energy, if that makes sense. Uh, by energy, I mean the states of energy, because energy, you know, there is only so much that universally we all have. There's only so much that Source has, so there's a finite amount of energy. However, you can create infinity with a finite amount of energy. So where I'm going with this is where, what state the collective energy is in determines everything. So going back to the question around time, again, source perceives things very differently. How can I explain it? If you're looking at a room and the room has some furniture in it, source is going to be very mindful of every single piece of furniture that exists in the room. For example, um, it's going to be a he's going, let, let me refer to source as he, although that is not strictly correct. Um, he would be, for instance, looking at the yellow couch and the wooden table and everything uh, else that is around the room. He would also be focusing on the things that are not in the room. And what would be very interesting for source is to start creating new things and new objects in the room. So the moment source would think of, I don't know, let's say a green armchair, that green armchair is going to instantly manifest within that room. That is just, you know, the, the, the prerogative of being source. It's, it's instant manifestation. So from source consciousness, the way um, he or she or it looks at reality is very different. He looks at the presence and the absence of things, right? Does the, ye uh, the, the yellow couch uh, exist? Does the green armchair exist? It's less important for source that the yellow couch has been in the room for three weeks and the green armchair has been in the room for 30 seconds. That is of no consequence to source. What is of consequence to source is that both of these objects are real and that they exist. People are very different. You know, you may care. And once we descend into this time-space reality, time becomes a means of keeping track of our lives and a means of maintaining continuity. That is why we are obsessed with time. That is why everything is very cyclical about our days. That's why we do a lot of things on autopilot. That's why we go by the cycles of the moon, the sun, and everything in between, right? I don't know if that makes sense, but in other words, we're a lot more concerned with the continuity and a human would be a lot more concerned with what came first, you know, the green couch or the yellow armchair. Sorry, I think I, I mixed the colors. It was the yellow couch and the green armchair. But Source just cares about the presence or the absence of these things, if that makes sense. That makes sense. But uh, if he knows um, like the outcome of the game, what's the point of playing the game in the first place then? Yeah, Source does not know the outcome of the game. That is the whole, pre uh, that is the whole point of... Um, having the game in the first place. Uh, I'll explain. If Source was in its unified state, then it has the same level of awareness of everything because it's one integral being, like a globule of light, right? So 
he can go about making decisions, creating things in the moment, and he has 100% of control. However, when Source decides to split itself, which is the game that we're playing right now, that's why there are all these souls that are created, Source doesn't know the outcome of the game because there is such thing as free will, and then there is such thing as the veil of forgetfulness. There is such thing as karma, the law of cause and effect, etc., etc. So there, there are all of these factors that make the game, if not random, then randomized. And not only that, it makes the game actually um, a game of multivariance. In other words, Source would be running multiple, uh, um, multiple projections, multiple games at the same time. How do I explain this in a way that makes sense to you guys? Um, uh, I, I think we, we've had this conversation about multiverse, a time where it doesn't, where um, I said, every time you're faced with a decision, from your perspective, from your limited perspective, you choose one or the other. For instance, if you were picking a major in college, you know that you either pick medicine, let's say, or law. However, from the perspective of source, both of these things were created, right? Or your higher self even has access to, to that level of granularity or that level of detail. So again, from your limited perspective, you may have just chosen to be a medical student, but there is a version of you out there that exists that also is studying law. And source is watching both of these. And more often than not, it's not just two options, but there is multiple. So source is keeping track of the multiverse. So when you're saying if everything is predetermined, like why would source even play the game? A, nothing is predetermined because even at the, the, at the level of higher self, a higher self may plan an incarnation and then a person, a being, descends into that incarnation and all the hell breaks loose, if that makes sense. Um, you, you, I don't know, forget who you are. You forget why you came here. You get into sometimes a hostile environment. You get all these trauma, drama, karma coming for you. And all of a sudden, what you wanted to do is not what you ended up doing, right? So no, Source is actually surprised very often But what ends up happening. Hmm. So, but where it becomes tricky is that if uh, there is no time and uh, the Source can see the past and the future and the present uh, in the same moment, it means that he already knows the future, the outcome, or if it's not, if it, if it's not correct. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. And I see how this can become tricky. Uh, I think where you guys get tripped up is the concept of the future, right? It kind of almost makes sense to you that Source knows the past. Am I correct? Yeah. Because if, if, if he is or she is whatever, if Source is um, omnipotent or omnipresent, right? It kind of makes sense to you that it sees the past and sees the present, right? Right. Where you guys get tripped up is the future, I think. Because again, you're in your linear thinking a little bit. And I'll explain what the difference is. So if you're trip type, tripped up by the future, let's just deal with, deal with the future because it seems like this is the, the hardest thing for you to understand. Here's the deal. Do you remember how I said source has an instant manifestation or from the perspective of source, everything always manifests instantly? Um, what is, so that is like the absence of the constraint of time from a source perspective, right? Whatever for you can take years, like getting a degree can take five years. For source consciousness, it's very quick. However, one thing to think about the future is there are two types of futures. And we've never been there before, but I wanna draw that distinction. The one kind of future is an imminent future that is based on the decisions that have been made. I'll give you an example. If let's say I am a director, that's my career, like a movie director, and I have signed on or decided that I really want to make a movie about spacecraft. I don't know, bear with me for this analogy. The moment I decided, right, and I truly intend to do this, right, for me as a human, the movie is, is not real yet. It hasn't been created yet. What has been created is an intention to create a movie. So that is, uh, the, from source perspective, the imminent future for this instance would be the creation of the movie. Meaning, from source perspective, when one of its uh, children, right, a soul, decides to make a movie, it's as good as done for source consciousness because the intention has already happened. 
And that's why this future becomes imminent. And by the way, even if from your limited perspective of a human, you, uh, you're a movie director and you are following a track or a lifeline um, where you failed to make a movie, it doesn't really matter because the multiverse exists. And that means that there is a version, another timeline somewhere where you have made that movie. That's one version of the future. And that is the kind that happens instantly for source consciousness. The kind that trips us all up is this one. It is the future that is undetermined, both for source and for you, mm -hmm. and for 100% of beings in the universe. And the reason it is undetermined is because there has been no intention yet to create something else new and different. Every time any part of source, any spark of source, any soul creates a new intention, there is a new vertical of reality or a new corner of reality, a new facet of reality that's being built from scratch. That's the aspect that surprises source. That's the aspect that doesn't happen all the time because intentions get birthed anew every single moment, every new moment that the universe is alive. Intentions get created all the time and they don't get created by source only. They get created by souls, right? I'm sure you have intentions um, that you come up with randomly and surprise yourself and your family sometimes. They're also sometimes called wishes. Wishing upon something could be a form of an intention, wanting something really badly, like a new, setting a new goal for yourself. All of those are different forms of creating of reality. Hmm. And no, source doesn't actually know what you're going to want in 10,000 seconds. And that's why this game is so exciting. Uh -huh. Okay, that explains a lot okay. because I myself was under the impression that Source knows everything and uh, I was like, why would he then play this game if it's uh, so predictable for Source, mean? right? Yeah. I think that's a really good question. Uh, thank you so much for submitting it. Yeah. And uh, I guess we can move to the next one. Uh, I think this one is clear. Um, is it true that our thoughts are not our own? It's a tricky question. Uh, I know what this is in reference to, though. Um, when I spoke about the mental body, I believe I mentioned that we often relate to our thoughts or the thoughts in our head as our own. And I, I may have stated that they're not technically our own, but we are rather like little antennas, little receptacles, and we are kind of like going our, on our merry way and we're grabbing things from from the mental collective mental space and then you know, once we grab onto something and our receptors in our mental body recognize it as desirable, um, then we internalize a thought. So when I said our thoughts are not our own, what I mean is when the matrix was created, this virtual reality was created, it wasn't just created as this lifeless carcass or skeleton. Um, it had to have dimension. And so when the architects planned this experience, they also created a slew, like a range of emotions and emotional states that would be uh, native to the matrix. And they created a slew of mental constructs, including belief systems and thoughts and thought forms, to go inside of the matrix as well. There are billions of thought forms out there that have been created. Granted, it's not like thought forms are not that complicated, you guys. It's not like um, like a Mona Lisa painting. Uh, thought forms actually and language is, is a very mathematical cons construct, if you think. So if you know um, all of the uh, potentially like all of the vowels and the consonants you're going to have in a language, um, it's very easy to make up words from there. And from there, it's actually very easy to make up belief systems and um, thought forms because they're kind of like one plus one equals two. There's always a formula for a thought form and a belief system or like a belief. So language was constructed, and all the languages, should I say, uh, were constructed by the architects of the matrix as well. Now, languages do evolve over time. Let me make that as a caveat. And thought, you know, as well as feelings, like they can be new ones that could be brought or experienced as the merge of the ones that existed. So it's almost like um, if you had a bunch of paints, right, and you had a red and a yellow, but didn't have the orange, 
you could mix up the red and the yellow and get the orange, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if, if the architects didn't give you the red and the yellow, you could not have gotten an orange, if that makes sense. So they gave you like a bunch of tools. They gave us a bunch of tools and we can co-create with those tools, but really they have set the game up for us in a very, very large way. And so what, um, that's why, I guess the point I was trying to make is that these thoughts originally exist in and of themselves as constructs do in the same way that elementals exist, you know, regardless and despite of, of, of humans and kind of like animals exist in and of themselves and the plant kingdom exists in and of themselves. There is a thought kingdom and then there is a feeling kingdom and they exist in and of themselves. And we partake of that kingdom. We interact with that kingdom in the same way that we interact with plant life by consuming it. We interact with thought forms by consuming them. And when I say consuming them is here's what you should think uh, or should imagine. Your mental body is a sphere. I often describe it as a sphere of light blue light, sorry, light blue color. Uh, or a vessel of light blue color sometimes, it's, it's somewhat transparent. So that represents your personal mental space. But that personal mental space is floating in the soup of a collective mental space that is filled with the kingdom of thoughts, thought forms and belief systems, or beliefs, core beliefs, I should be saying, not systems, because they're not terribly organized. And your mental body is like reaching out and scanning the soup that it's floating in, in and adopts or consumes certain thoughts. And once you consume a thought, then it becomes from, it changes from being an external uh, energy to becoming an internal energy because you consumed it. In the same way that if you ate, had an apple for, for lunch, right? The apple was just there, maybe on a tree or in a store. It wasn't really yours. And it kind of couldn't care less about you. The apple would have existed anyway, whether you went to the store and picked it up today or you didn't, the apple could care less, kind of. Mm. The tree may, may, maybe <laughs> cares whether you consume the apple because it doesn't like wasting things. But the, from the perspective of the apple, it's fine either way. Everything is an experience with the apple. But when you consume the apple, it becomes yours. Your body starts processing it. It becomes your apple. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, does. Same thing with thoughts. Is it possible to create um, an original thought or there is no such a thing as an original thought in this case? The original thought. So, OK. I love this question and I hate this question, um, but uh, it, the best questions are like really tricky like that. The, the true definition of the original thought is the thought that belonged to God or source or absolute before source created the universe. That is the true definition of the original thought because arguably the one and only original thinker is source. Mm. And when you're saying or asking about an original thought, you know, your brain, your mental body cannot come up with any thought that would not, that would be so original or unique that um, source consciousness could have never come up with that, if that makes sense. <laughs> so from this perspective, I don't know that any of our thoughts are that original, I hate to say this. Um, however, what you are referring to and where I would say yes, is exactly my, ex uh, my um, example from earlier about the red paint and the yellow paint. And you can combine these things and make it orange. That mm. is entirely possible. That is entirely possible. In other words, you build the, and that is like the great inventions could also happen that way. Like you, you know, you take the familiar things and the twist them all of a sudden there is the aha moment. So um, that would be one, I guess, definition of an original thought. Another one, which doesn't happen that often again, because um, the soup, of the matrix and, and how these, so um, um, let me rewind. You guys are familiar with the quantum universe uh, concept, right? Yep. That the universe is built of quants. What are the quants? Um, quants are kind of like minimal particles of energy that come in different formats. A color 
can be a quant. Um, a molecule could be a quant. Um, a particular um, audio frequency, like a wave of a sound, can be a quant, etc., etc., etc. A word, a word of a language is a quant. Um, a letter is an even smaller quant. So the The equations was the word that I was looking for. The equations that the architects used to define this time-space reality were so that they have already come, come up with every single combination of the quants that could possibly exist. Mm -hmm. So in other words, every possible combination of letters and every possible combination of words has already been created and is available to you to draw from. Interesting. So from that perspective, I don't necessarily know that we have a lot of original thoughts. However, um, there is something, right? Because here's, here's another way to think about it. And that's where it gets really complicated, potentially. The matrix is a very complex organism. And just because we here live on planet Earth and we're inside of the matrix, doesn't mean that we have access to the entirety of creation of the architects because we live in a world of a particular dimension and we are experiencing the, uh, the world a certain way, right? I, I keep saying that planet Earth is a very masculine, masculine planet, et cetera, et cetera. So there, you know, the, the hand has been dealt, right? Just because we are here and we've arrived doesn't mean that we have full access to the brain um, of the architects. Mm. Here's where I'm going with this. You guys are all familiar with dimensions to some degree, right? So there are dimensions and then progressively as dimensions go up, beings become more evolved, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these are just layers of the matrix. There are, when you unlock a new dimension, you unlock new frequencies. When you unlock new frequencies, you unlock new thoughts that are associated with that frequency and you unlock new feelings associated with that frequency. In the same way that certain planets are missing certain archetypes, or certain archetypes are dying out, like sometimes souls need to come here and bring and birth a certain archetype. For instance, um, a programmer, um, a, a Java <laughs> script programmer, hasn't existed as an archetype, uh, I don't know, a hundred years ago. And so somebody had to come in and become the poster child for that archetype. When the new archetype gets anchored in a, on a particular planet, it opens up like a new pocket of the matrix. And so new thoughts and feelings start emerging in that side of the matrix that are associated or vibe at the same level as the as, as the frequency of that new archetype. However, I wouldn't call it original thought mm -hmm. because it was still created by the architects. It just hasn't been unlocked on planet Earth. Um, where this can get confusing is it may seem that now because the Earth is in the process of moving from 3D to 5D, there have been original thoughts that have been created, but really it's just because we've unlocked 5D. Mm -hmm. And those thoughts are really not that originally to say. Again, right. Yeah. Uh, nothing is original for source. No. Again, if we go really up, uh, yeah. nothing is original. No. He's the He's original seen it all. creator. I yeah. know. Yeah, but it does make sense. Uh, thank you so much for answering this question. Um, I think we can move to the next one. Sure. Uh, where do I start if I want to raise my vibrations? You gave so many amazing practices and meditations. I don't know where to put my time and energy first. I, okay. You see where this is getting complicated? Um, this is a question from a particular person. And my answer to her is going to be very different compared to my answer to the human collective. So if I may, I would like to first answer to her specifically. And then I would like to answer to the rest of the human collective as if this question was asked to me by the human collective. Is that okay with you? Yeah, works for me. Okay, so the lady that's asking the question, um, I, I find it endearing uh, because she's just such a light soul. Her problem is um, 
having a very busy mind. A very busy mind that is obstructing the view of upstairs. And that is actually very different from potentially the, you know, uh, the rest of humanity. Or maybe not so different, but uh, that, that would not be the first place to start for a lot of people. So for her in particular, it's very important to go into the quiet zones. And specifically in the head, in, in her head. So it's very important for her to work on meditative techniques that really just remove the thoughts. There are thousands of meditation techniques out there and you know one of the most basic ones is decluttering your mind right mm -hmm. um, because that is the one thing that's actually most missing for her in order to feel like she's moving in the right direction she just has a very very busy mind and that makes her over analyze everything including her path but your path towards awakening cannot be over analyzed it is a path that needs to be walked with your heart even sometimes more so than with your brain. But when your brain is taking over and running the show, then we're missing the point. And that is why no other answer that I could give her right now would serve her outside, outside of declutter the mental. Mm. Create space, pockets of space in your head. And she'll, for people that have a busy mind, journaling is a must have. You have to develop a practice that enables you to put things on paper so they don't have to clutter your poor head. All of your thoughts, don't judge them. Just put them on paper and put them on paper. So like you need to, like that is your process of decluttering. You know, some people, when they're decluttering, they need to throw out like a bunch of clothes. Some people <laughs> need to throw out their old forks and knives. And she in particular, and a lot of other humans, need to declutter their thoughts. And the best way to do that is to spit them out on paper. So journaling is really, really good for somebody like that. Um, okay, can you read the question one more time and I'll answer it from, from the Human Collective. Yeah, uh, where do I start if I want to raise my vibrations? Uh, you gave so many amazing practices and meditations. I don't know where to put my time and energy first. I mean, given that we, I guess, recorded a lot of podcast episodes, so much information, and I believe she also purchased uh, the book uh, 72 Keys to Manifestation, and she's maybe struggling to prioritize her practices. Yeah. Well, you see, I mean, the good and the bad news is there's not one way to walk the path. Um, everybody's a very unique snowflake. And it's really hard and useless to try to fit into a template. So if I were trying to give like a blanket answer to this question, I would probably say this. Start with the physicality first. First, take care of the physical body. It is very tempting to want to go into the etheric realm and talk to your, you know, higher self and guides and meet all the cool, I don't know, folks upstairs. However, if your physical body is ailing or aching or is in the way, then it's going to be really hard for your energy body to keep up. So it always starts at the physical level. So in other words, when you're struggling with a start, remember that you are essentially uh, like a, a matryoshka doll, like a Russian doll, right? Your inner aspect is your physical body. The next body out there is the energy body. The next one is emotional. The fourth one is the mental. So when in doubt of where to start, always start from the very inner body and then move out on your path. So first take care of the physical. What does that mean? Take care of what you're consuming physically, right? Obviously, uh, meats are really bringing you down. So those are very heavy, dense energies. Same goes for any kind of other, um, you know, um, I don't know, like fish or seafood. All of that is a type of meat, right? So they, they lower your vibrations. Um, that's where I would start. If you have any physical, like, disease or ailments, um, 
that would be a very, very important aspect to address as well. Uh, and I'm not just saying, you know, I don't just mean like take a bunch of medications, but there are a lot of very wonderful healing modalities um, that could help on the physical. The second is dealing with your energy body. Dealing with your energy body is where you get to address your trauma from this lifetime first. So take care of the things that are most relevant to you. Again, skipping steps is not something that is advisable. Because if you skip a couple of steps, you are going to slow down your pro progress, actually, unbeknownst to you. And you're going to have to go back and fix those steps anyhow. What are some of the most important critical steps? Healing your relationship with your mother and with your father. I know it doesn't sound terribly spiritual and it's not as cool as talking to an angel, but that's where it all begins, right? Healing your ancestry line because it is kind of like an extension of healing your relationship with your parents. Um, then working with the chakras would be the next thing that I would do, right? Just getting to understand, because that's all the etheric body, that's all energy work, right? So your second body. So understanding your chakras, you know, and working with all of your chakras, starting from the root to the crown. Mostly focusing on the solar plexus and the heart. These are the two critical chakras. Um, now, maybe let me take that back. The solar plexus and the heart, if you're trying to build the bridge towards awakening. However, if you have a lot of trauma and, and karma that is still stuck in the root center and the sacral, you're going to have to address those first. Again, don't skip levels. Don't just go to the crown, crown center because it sounds cool. Don't start opening your third eye if... Um, you have issues around like your your lower centers and you for instance you don't feel safe to I don't know express creatively you know that's the sacral center like don't 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 bypass um yeah so working with the energy body um only then would I try to work through emotions and empathy and, and heart opening and all of that and last is doing all types of mental cleaning um you know, I would say that, and I, I believe that a part of that question was also, at what point should I start manifesting? You know, and it, it is, is manifesting too early. Again, there's no right or wrong way. That's the one thing you should walk away. Like, if there's one thing that you <laughs> learned from me is that there is no right or wrong way of doing things. There's just your way. And it's beautiful. And nobody can tell you otherwise. And if they are, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so, um if you feel cold to manifest and you you still are dealing with your physical issues, that's cool also. Always listen to yourself, listen to your heart, listen to your intuition. Again, no right or wrong. You cannot do it wrong. However, if you are overwhelmed and you're trying to do too much, then that just doesn't serve you, right? And then you're gonna have to play the game of focus, which is saying no, not saying yes, right? The game of focus is all about all, what are the things that you're gonna say no to, right? But again, um, manifestation, you can try during any of these stages of healing. However, I will tell you that if you remain terribly unhealed in one part of yourself, in one of your bodies, it's going to be a lot harder for you to manifest. Uh, because people who have boatloads of unhealed trauma, uh, inadvertently and subconsciously, waste and send a lot of their energy to deal with that trauma. It's like carrying a heavy backpack. When you're carrying a heavy backpack and you're going up the mountain, that going is going to be pretty hard because you have weights, like you have a weight that you're carrying. And that, you know, trying to manifest things when you have three back heavy backpacks on your back ain't fun and it's not going to be that effective. So, if you're even asking yourself the question of, you know, is it too early for me to, ma to manifest? The answer is probably, you know, probably there's something else that is a little bit urgent that you need to address in the moment. <laughs> I hope this was helpful. I feel, like, I feel like I went on a tangent a little bit. Yeah, it was a good one. Um, uh, yeah, I, I've been in this kind of situation myself when you're just trying to do everything in parallel and uh, you get really overwhelmed. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. It's uh, I think it's very helpful. Um, 
switching the gears and uh, I think we're going back to source and <laughs> these are my favorite questions <laughs> about source um, what is um, actually does source have a shadow side and if yes uh, what would be the shadow side of uh, source um source takes every single being that came out of source as a part of itself source doesn't draw strict lines between this is me and this is not me source perceives everything as itself so he's like this human is me and this river is me and this house is me and this lightning strike is me and this other planetary system is me and everything else in between is also me so where i'm going with this is this whatever shadow you have or you think you have inadvertently is also the shadow of source right because you are a part of source so if you have identified something as a shadow aspect and there is something you don't want to deal with shadow doesn't mean bad shadow means hidden right there's something that's hidden from you or you're rejecting for one reason or another that automatically becomes the shadow of source right and the process of going back into unity consciousness is the process of working through the shadow the collective shadow the collective shadow is real and that would be one of the definitions of the shadow of source um very often the those shadows cluster together as well we haven't really discussed this but at soul level at the level of your higher self if you accumulate enough things of the same caliber that you're just not ready to process it could be anything like i don't know maybe this is a morbid example but um let's say that you go into an incarnation and when the going gets tough your pattern is committing suicide I'm just saying, I don't know, a uh, random example. And then let's say that you did it so many bloody times that it became a pattern. And then every time you go back and you rejoin with your higher self, you're like, why, why did I do this? I mean, come on, like how many more times? And if that becomes like a true, true pattern, there is a density that's created within that pattern. And that density becomes heavy. Um, it's almost like it becomes like a heavy load again on you. And what happens sometimes is if that thing, if you reject to that part of you that commits suicide or that's capable of committing suicide and throw away this wonderful opportunity for learning that is the life, you may choose to completely split it off into another being. And those splits occur at soul level all the time. So if we wanted to get an even more defined definition of the shadow of source it would be those rejected parts at soul level that other souls didn't want to deal with to such a degree that they chose to split themselves from from those parts hmm. that would be another answer to that question that's very interesting um and uh, so does it mean that source himself uh, doesn't deal with shadow it's all up to humans and other beings that generate these shadows to deal with them? Um, <laughs> how should I put this? Um, source is light. Initially, when source is unity, there's no shadow mm -hmm. because it knows and accepts 100% of what it is or who he is or who she is. And then we start the splitting and rotation situation where it starts dividing itself into all of these aspects. And those aspects initially represent pure light. But when they go down into an incarnation, they go through experiences. And these experiences, experiences make them create aspects within themselves or trauma within themselves or splits within themselves mm. that now have a shadow. And yeah, it's kind of up to those parts now to fix it. Mm. So it's not his problem, right? I mean, ultimately, everything is his problem, right? I just don't think that that's how Source thinks about it. I don't. Okay. It, it's like a you know, life as usual, not yeah, a problem. He, he kind of delegates uh, this. Uh... Well, I wouldn't say so. Um, every little, 
every little, every single being in the universe has a connection to source consciousness. So make no mistake, source is extremely interested in helping you work through your shadow. Mm -hmm. And so source is extremely involved in that process. Who do you think is the driving force behind 100% of your spirit guides? I mean, it's yes, it's them wanting to help, but they are wanting to help because they are mimicking what source would have done. Mm, right. Because yes, source is their teacher, right? And so, yes, behind every single, I don't know, a session of shadow work or parts work that you do is source as your great teacher, as somebody with infinite patience who's walking, you know, kind of like holding your hand as you're walking this path. So to say that source just offloads it on you and like wishes you adieu is not necessarily correct. Right. I would yeah. give source a bit more credit here. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think it's uh, clear now. Um, yeah, thank you for explaining this. Um, I guess uh, moving to the next one. How does the life look like for a higher self? What is the purpose of the higher self? Like, yeah, how does it live? Like, what does it do? <laughs> sure. Yeah. There's not, not one answer to the question because um, every higher self is created differently, right? We're not all copycats of each other upstairs in the same way that we're not all copycats of each other here, right? You'd be fairly tight pressed to find a soul with an exactly the same set of past lives, you know, uh, present lives, trauma, etc. You'd be tight pressed to do that. Everybody is a unique snowflake. Hate to say this. So, um, so what does the higher self do upstairs? It actually depends because every higher self has free will. Um, so every higher self also has the plans for its own development and every higher self actually has guides or teachers upstairs as well. In the same way that you can have mentors here, whether they're physical or etheric, your higher self has mentors as well. And so there are planning sessions between your higher self and their mentors around their evolutionary path or an evolutionary arc. And from there, it really depends, right? Some souls want to practice their feminine uh, aspects. Other souls want to practice their masculine aspects. Some souls want to practice their nurturing aspects. And so they could join and like, um, um, if you want to practice like the nurturing aspect, you could join one of the nunneries, not the mm -hmm. nunneries. Um, you know, the places where like the, there are young souls that just got split off from source. Um, try, I'm, I'm blanking nurseries? on the word. Nurseries, not nurseries. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh my God. It starts with the same letter. Um, nurseries. Yes, there are nurseries where these, uh, these beings, they're very, you know, it's, it's a touchy feely, um, thing to be birthed <laughs> and so they need tender loving care so some higher selves would join as nurses um to these like little babies essentially soul babies um some souls some higher selves want to be healers and there are ample opportunities to be healers even at source uh, sorry at, at higher self level for instance there could be souls that are going through traumatic experience in in the matrix for example the second world war or something of that nature, like where a lot of people died and was like a lot of trauma around it. There are, when these souls come upstairs or dis disincarnate, there's all this trauma that they need to work through and they need healers. And those healers um, are other higher selves that want to heal. There are warriors um, at the level of the higher self. There are politicians at the level of the higher self. There are researchers at the level of the higher self. There are keepers, there, there are keepers of the Akashic record. So your librarians, like there are essentially, they, they have careers is what I'm trying to say. They have careers. Um, some, some of them do, not everybody. It's not necessary. You can not have a career if that's your thing. Um, and then another thing that's different is what portion, what percentage of their own energy, your higher self splits and sends into incarnations as well. Uh, and it can be anywhere from 5%. Well, actually, some of them don't incarnate, so 0%, I guess, but that's not normal. Uh, anywhere from 5% to 90% can go of their um, energy can go into an incarnation. 
um, enough of higher selves belong to the hierarchy of light or the spiritual government. So that is where all of your angels and archangels come through and come in. So that could be a way to pass the time. 100% of your higher selves, though, have a soul family. So you have, you know, your soul family, you uh, have a twin flame. So you have communities, so they ha you have extended soul families. So uh, they uh, gather together and they, you know, exchange information, they communicate, they share frequencies, they share love. Um, essentially, they're, they're having family life. And then every single higher self also has their own personal space, um, which is... 100% constructed by them from scratch. And it is kind of like their zone to be alone, their zone to think, reminisce, plan, feel. And those types of environments are, they could range from, um, for instance, your higher self may um, experience a lifetime on an exotic planet and they really loved it. And let's say that that planet had pink rivers and a purple sun. I'm just making it up. Um, and then they come back from that incarnation and they're like, oh, I felt so good there and I feel so nostalgic. And so they'll just build a room in their quote unquote house that would remind them of that planet. And it's going to have a pink river and the purple sun. Hmm. And so building those virtual environments is actually another good pastime. Some higher selves like gardening because <laughs> hmm. they remember their human experience of gardening. It's different. You know, it grows instantly unless they force it not to <laughs> so interesting so uh, as a higher self let's say you are upstairs outside of this matrix and uh like are you like a an energy sphere or you can be a humanoid form or and uh then do you go to school and you said some of them are in uh, the government right so there is social life as well uh, upstairs yeah. is that correct yes it's not the same um as here but yes and they can actually choose to like th their form and shape they can choose whatever form they want to take mm. um and and it's it's always changes too it always changes like they don't keep the form the same so interesting yeah they can float around looking like spheres then walk around looking like cubes then all of a sudden everybody is a dragon and um, <laughs> so, yeah, they, they don't there's no shape and the only reason they like they have shapes is because they want to have fun with it yeah and also they grow attachments you grow attachments um you go through incarnations you play a lot of, like how do i explain this so that you guys can understand like okay some people just like fantasy novels right and so uh for those people that like fantasy novels they may have their favorite fantasy characters like some people love elves and some people like dragons and other people like fairies. And you have other people that dislike all of that and just like robots because they, they were big Star Wars fans. So when they disincarnate and go back, the fact that they felt an, felt an affinity towards like an elf versus a robot doesn't go away. And so, you know, your higher self may choose to show up as a robot for like eons just because it pleases it. Because there are no rules. Interesting. And uh, again, as I understand, time uh, is very different there yeah so for example if uh, uh you uh, maria's higher self is here does it mean that your attention focuses fully on this let's say uh video um that we're having or it's kind of in the same time in many many different places it's in many different places mm. in fact you would be type pressed to uh have higher your higher self pay close attention to you at all times that almost never happens because from the perspective of your higher self, hmm, you're not that compelling. <laughs> I hate to say this. The opposite is true. Your higher self is always somehow more compelling than you are, but like the, the reverse is not always true. It's kind of like, you know, like a, if you had a deck of cards and you looked at, um, and one of the deck of cards was, I don't know, like a queen of, queen of wands. And you look at the queen of wands. I mean, you right now as human wouldn't stare at the queen of wands card for 90 years of your life would you because no. you'd be like uh three hours in i'm really bored with this and most likely like two minutes in, i'm really bored with this and and th that that's kind of like the difference between like your intelligence as a human versus a card is the same 
difference or gap between your lower self that is incarnated here and your higher self upstairs. So I hate to say it, you're kind of you we're, we're kind of like the queen of wands mm -hmm. at, at the lower plane. So they don't really they're not that fascinated. So however, however, if you start making moves or shaking things up, then your higher self would pay attention, but it's not always. Mm -hmm. Very often you're going to have other guides that are either lower vibrational or somehow tied to planet Earth that are going to be a lot more engaged with you. Quick example is a guardian angel. A guardian angel is with you 100% of your time. And whether you're leading an interesting life or not so interesting life, a guardian angel is stuck with you. Your higher self doesn't always pay attention. That's why it, uh, it's so hard for a lot of people to connect to it. Mm -hmm. And yes, your higher self at all times um, maintains multiple uh, focal points. Um, it, it, in other words, it has the capacity and it can choose moving things up into favorites and then uh, downgrading them into like, okay, I'm, I'm not really going to pay too much attention to that. Yeah. Wow. But I will tell you, um, I mean, obviously this is a virtual reality. So this is like a computer game. And of course, when you're playing a computer game, you're very engaged. Uh, you can be immersed in it. But it's not quite as immersive as the real world, so to say, right? So whatever is happening in the hierarchy of light or upstairs kind of is more meaningful to a lot of higher selves than the game. Hmm. Okay, I see that. That's very interesting. Uh, I wish I could see how it's all happening. Oh, well, you can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are meditations for that. Right. It's not that hard. Right. Next time you talk to your higher self or next time you do a meditation, you can always ask your higher self to show you around upstairs. Hmm. You can just be like, hey, can you take me to where you guys hang out with, you know, our soul family? Can you show me the soul family? Can you show me like your favorite places in your own like little house? Hmm. And I'm, I'm using the word house like very loosely here because they're not like houses. They're just really like environments. Hmm. And what about source? Um, uh, is there a specific place where the, there it kind of exists? In the very know? center. <laughs> In the very center. In the very there center is of a it center, all. or everything is source, and Ev there is no center. In this there is everything is source, and there is a center. And there is a center. Yeah. And uh, can anybody uh, up there come to source, or it's? Uh, um, you know, it's like a king and nobody, not everybody can get access to it. It depends. Um, so everybody can get access to source even from here. Mm -hmm. However, uh, what degree of attention you're getting from source is a very different question. Like, is source going to pay attention to you with one billionth of its attention span? Or is it going to reserve one tenth of its attention span? And that's really where the difference happens. Mm -hmm. So everybody can get source's attention, not everybody to the same degree. Got it. And uh, if we're talking about upstairs, uh, in this case, you just uh, connect mentally with the, you don't have to go to source, right? You don't them, have to go, right? but just... a lot of a lot of beings choose to go to an actual space. Yeah. So yeah. there is an actual space yeah. where there is a representation of him. Is it like a sphere of light? Or it's he both, can be actually. A... So uh, do you remember how I told you that um, your higher self essentially has environments that it's built for itself? Yeah. Source has the same thing. In other words, in, in fact, your your higher self, everybody's higher self, built their own environments because they learned from source. Mm -hmm. So source still contains a nucleus. It is still um, it has the nucleus um, that always comes across. It looks like a giant white sun. That's the best I can describe it. Um, and it always uh, that always is the center of um, rotational axis. What I mean by that is when the universe expands and the universe is always either expanding or contracting. By the way, when the universe contracts, that's the same thing. Whatever is happening with the universe, it always happens around point zero. The cats are really active today, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it always happens at point zero. And that point zero is the nucleus of source consciousness. So source consciousness is the zero coordinate and everything rotates around that center. Um, whether that rotates in the, in the clockwise direction when the universe is expand expanding or counterclockwise direction when the universe is contracting. It still happens along the same central axis. Now, 
there is almost like the I'm going to use human human language. Trust me, I have to really reduce it. There is the kingdom around this white sun. And that kingdom is a bunch of environments that Source built for itself. And Source can choose to create like a little emanation of it where it comes across very humanoid. Hmm. And by the way, he can choose an emanation that is more masculine, more feminine, or androgynous. It doesn't really matter. And very often when beings come to Source, you know, very often source would appear as a humanoid form or another mm. form that it chooses to be that day. Like a Metatron cube. It can mm. show up as a Metatron cube. It's not always the white sun, which is not to say the white sun always stays static. The white sun doesn't go anywhere. So uh, one thing, I don't want to create any more confusion. It's not like that white sun flips into a human. That's not what's happening. The white sun, the nucleus of source always stays because the center needs to always keep its integrity hmm. for the rest of the system to not fall apart. However, because Source is so mighty, it can have a billion projections of itself without missing a beat. And when it does the projection as its true self, it's just going to put 100% of its consciousness and not its split version into another form that may look like a geometric shape or may look like a human or may look like another extraterrestrial. It doesn't really matter. But very often when a being would come and ask for an audience with source, um, yeah, it, it'll, it, it, it's not just going to be a globule of light floating around. Got it. Um, all right. Thank you for answering this question. Um, yeah, I think it's now much clearer <laughs> for me how it works up, upstairs. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, can a higher self be evil? How does a higher self guide an incarnation who meant to enact evil? I have a hard time answering the question about evil because there is such a big gap between how humanity perceives good versus evil and how you know even beings in seven dimension in the seventh dimension perceive um good and evil, let alone how the higher self perceives good and evil, let alone how, how source consciousness perceives good and evil. Um, from the perspective of source, everything is an experience. From the perspective of your higher self, everything is a learning opportunity. So they don't, they're not so quick at putting a label on a happening, an event or a circumstance. In fact, so like they don't like putting the word evil on things. Um, and they don't even perceive that as such. In other words, being murdered by someone and murdering somebody from a perspective of the higher self could be considered all good, right? Depending on the intention. And here is where the core crux of this issue lies. Let's say your, um, and again, not stepping back, uh, let, let's say your higher self wants to understand um, murder. It's just a fascinating subject for your higher self. If it wants to understand murder, it's going to have to come and incarnate many, many times over. And it wants to experience it from every angle. So your higher self may choose to come as a victim, as the mother of the victim, as the father of the victim, as the teacher of the victim, as the murderer, as the murder, as the mother of the murderer, yada, 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 yada. As the mayor of the city where the murder happened, as the police department, like head of the police department that was investigating the murder, et cetera, et cetera. The judge who was judging the person who committed the murder. And then, it, it's not going to stop from there, right? So let's say it took all of those experiences um, and it feels like it understands murder a little bit better. Then it's going to want to experience murder to a higher degree. For example, well, I know what it feels like to kill one person. What does it feel like to kill 30 people? What does it feel like to kill 100,000? You know what I mean? And is it evil? 
not if your intention is to understand murder. Because by the virtue of you understanding murder, you are sharing that learning and you're uploading it up to the Akashic Records where everybody else can learn from it. And that is a very important distinction to make. Because at one point, somebody has to be the soul that is going to get the learning of what it feels like for the rest of existence and for the rest of the higher selves and, you know, for source itself, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody has to take one for the team, so to say, and learn. And that is how you may get like a mass murderer or somebody who starts a world war, or somebody who, I don't know, blows up a nuke and kills, uh, demolishes a whole city, right? That is one way that you can get there. Um, in this particular instance, right? Again, the intention of your higher self is learning. Um, however, where this becomes problematic, and again, I have a very hard time assigning a label evil to anything below the third dimension. Let's just call it what it is. Because that good versus evil kind of only exists here and below. One thing where this can become a little tricky is this. Let's say your higher self intends to heal people. Healing is its, its thing that it wants to do. But let's say it descends into this incarnation, gets into the veil of forgetfulness, and instead of healing people, it starts murdering people. Just, I don't know, for whatever reason. Maybe because there is some trauma, drama in the, in the childhood, maybe because they saw a movie where somebody murdered, somebody thought it was cool, so they essentially went off the, the bandwagon. This is treated a little bit differently. Because the intention was one, um, like X, and the outcome was Y, right? That is still, by the way, not considered evil. It's just considered suboptimal because it wasn't planned. Now, is that still a learning? Yes. Ultimately, you know, is it still good to learn? Absolutely. However, that is where you get splits at higher self level, right? Because your higher self remembers that it wanted to be a healer. And then it has a, an aspect of itself that comes back and it's a murderer. And your higher self is like, whoa, what do I do with this? And that's where they create an, a split or a shadow, right? And then some higher selves may even start perceiving that aspect that they split as evil just because they cannot process it. Hmm. But is that aspect evil? Not from source perspective, it's not. Hmm. So interesting. So uh, And evil is just a matter of perspective. What's right. good for one person is evil for another person. And by the way, like look at Hitler. He's one of the, the, the poster child children for like being an evil person. Do you know how many millions of souls benefited from learning from the experience that he has created? So here you may put, you know, like look at a character like him and be like, oh, he's completely evil. And upstairs, his experience was the greatest, one of the greater, um, you know, sources of knowledge of, you know, of 3D planet Earth warfare. Mm -hmm. And that is benefiting so many different souls in, in, on their evolutionary path. So is he evil? Not really. I don't think so. So interesting. So just um, it means that some higher selves choose to take this path. And uh, it seems like it's maybe a bit less desirable than other ones because we don't have that many uh, murderers and uh, mass murderers, especially. Right. Um, but they still choose to do so for their own development. Like, well, how, do you want me to give you an, uh, an even better example? Yeah. Do you think playing World of Warcraft is evil because you're killing things? Like in a computer game? Yeah. People don't think it's evil, yes. <laughs> I know. Same same logic. It's a computer game from yeah. higher self level. Like, fine. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Any of those RPG games, I think RPG is what they're called, right? Like, where, where you, like, go and, like, murder, you know... Uh, all kinds of beings every which way through Sunday with all kinds of weapons. And you're like, I need the strength and I need the skill and let me have this gun and I want a bigger gun and even more bullets and blah, blah, blah. Hmm. I mean, 
you go in, you may have murdered a thousand beings on a screen, and then you go in your merry way and nobody's pointing a finger at you at work and being like, this is a mass murderer. But how is that any different? Mm. So that's what I'm saying. Like what we perceive as evil is not, it's not the same experience. Now you as an avatar, right? You as a person who chooses to play a game, you choose what game you want to play, right? Like you may go and play Candy Crush. You may go and play Frozen on your iPhone, or you may go and play World of Warcraft. And d nothing makes you a bad person. All of these are experiences, mm. right? And they, and they serve you as experiences. But playing Candy Crush doesn't make you a better human being because you're not killing anything compared to, you know, uh, killing somebody in the war of war or world of Warcraft. Wow, that's a very different perspective. Uh, yeah mind-blowing actually <laughs> well, i'm glad i get to blow your mind yes and uh thank you so much for submitting your questions and this one was a really good one thank you for submitting it and uh i think that would be it for today that's our q a uh, part one uh, there will be more we still have a very big list of questions and uh yeah thank you so much yay thank you guys and we'll we'll be back with more Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye.